<laughs> well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our June 2023 Atopic Dermatitis Educational Webinar. Next slide. So the purpose of today's webinar was really for a chance for our pediatric dermatologic experts to provide some additional information on important topics related to atopic dermatitis that were initially scheduled to be covered on last month's May action period call, but due to time, we just didn't have an opportunity to cover those. So we wanted to make sure that we got that information out to you. Next slide. So uh, my name is Chris Peltier. Um, I'm the primary care expert for the program. I'm a pediatrician at Pediatric Associates of Mount Carmel in Cincinnati, and I'm also the president of the Ohio chapter of the AAP. Next slide. And I think you, everyone knows our pediatric dermatologic experts, but I wanted to introduce, um, uh, first up is going to be Dr. Patricia Treadwell, who is our dermatology expert from the Indiana University School of Medicine. And Pat's going to be covering cultural considerations and atopic dermatitis. She's going to talk about some recommendations for bathing and really whether sort of advantages and disadvantages of bathing versus non-bathing. She's going to cover wet wraps. She's going to briefly talk about pityriasis alba, and then she's going to finish up with sunscreen recommendations. Next slide. And then our second um, pediatric dermatologic expert is Dr. Esteban Fernandez-Faith, who is medical director of pediatric dermatology at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And uh, for, uh, Esteban's going to cover steroid phobia, natural treatments, and a little bit of some cultural differences um, between sort of East and Western medicine. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Treadwell, who's going to kick us off with talking about some cultural considerations. Pat? Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the things that um, are maybe different in our diverse populations. Um, dry skin um, that occurs in darkly pigmented skin is described as ashy. Uh, I can't say how many times I've gone in the room and the children uh, disrobe for the exam and the mother says, you didn't put your lotion on. And so uh, that tends to be in darkly pigmented skin, the scale or xerosis that you see on the skin um, is whitish and um, something that the parents tend to tell the children to put uh, an emoluent on. Uh, one of the things to do is discuss what uh, emoluent the parents prefer. Uh, I was just at a, an Academy of Pediatrics meeting. Um, often I get asked, what's your favorite moisturizer or emollient? Um, my favorite is what the parents are going to put on and what the child's going to tolerate being put on. Um, and so if you discuss what they typically use, then um, that can you can try to match that. If they're using a Vaseline type product, then you can match that um, with a thicker, or if they're using something not as thick, then try to match that. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things to think about since eczema or atopic dermatitis does occur in the hair is to think about more tightly coiled hair. It tends to hold less moisture than less coiled hair and very frequent shampooing can increase the dryness and the breakage of the hair itself. Again, um, if a family is shampooing every two weeks uh, when a dermatologist might prescribe shampooing every other day, then uh, actually the parents um, don't necessarily say anything in the exam room. They just don't do it. Uh, and so talk to the parents about how often they're shampooing. I usually will ask them to de decrease, like if they're doing every two weeks, to try to do it every week. Uh, again, asking the type of products that they might use. If there's atopic dermatitis in the scalp, uh, then uh, you can apply a topical steroid as one of your treatments. But if they're using, what do they usually put on the scalp? If it's an oil, if it's a, a Vaseline type base, 
um, then try to match that. Uh, so it won't be, they're putting something different on the scalp, but it's not as different as if you don't even try to um, match that to what they've already been using. Next slide, please. One thing I think that many of us don't think about is whether they have a tub or not available in the home, um, because many of our recommendations involve um, using a tub. Now, the uh, National Eczema Association recommendations um, actually are either a bath or shower, um, but many other things that I think we recommend, we are making an assumption that a tub is available and it may not be. And if it's not available, then we need to talk about how to do things differently. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, one of the recommendations that we've talked about a lot um, is if the children are having secondary infection with staph, uh, then um, dilute bleach baths are, can be very helpful. The recipe is a half a cup in a full tub of water and a fourth of a cup in a half full tub. And for infants, if, you're, if you have a separate bathing area or you have a sink that you can put a seat in, um, then, then to decrease that amount. This is regular household bleach. Um, and when you put it in the water, it becomes a dilute bleach bath. Uh, that can uh, certainly recommendations to go along with that are to um, not let the child dunk their head in the water, um, that their head stays whatever amount you put in, um, make sure that's kind of neck down. Um, they You don't want them drinking water, drinking the bath, the bleach bath. And... Um, Early on when this was used, there was a discussion about uh, some children with asthma um, who actually the bleach in the uh, sort of breathing in the bleach could, could cause some issues. And so to think about that and make sure that the area is um, has plenty of ventilation. Now, can I ask you, how often do you typically recommend that families do the bleach baths? Uh, usually about two to three times a week. And uh, that that's the typical. Um, it can be less often. Um, it, it does take work. And as we know with our busy parents, uh, that we want to give them a range so they don't feel um, put upon completely or guilty about not doing what we ask them to do. Now, in terms of bathing, uh, including the including the bleach baths, but also general bathing, we recommend soaking for 10 to 15 minutes um, and then uh, to rinse off uh, with clear water. And those instructions um, are um, very, um, our assistant has been made them available and it's, it's included on our Ohio AAP's eczema action plan. Next slide, please. So early in my career, there was the bathing versus non-bathing. Um, the question was whether uh, if you don't bathe the children that they don't dry out. Um, and so, but I looked through a number of sources and non-bathing is not recommended. I, I put that it's less popular. It's almost non-existent. Um, but so bathing is a soap. So again, that you put the child in clear water is probably best. If the parents are interested in some cleanser, it needs to be very gentle cleanser. Um, we don't recommend bubble bath. Um, because that is a detergent to make the bubbles. Um, and so we don't recommend that in children with atopic dermatitis. So you consider it a clear water soak, 10 to 15 minutes, that during that time you're hydrating the stratum corneum, and then you seal it with an emollient. 
Uh, the water should not be too hot or too cold, um, very cold water. And then you have your poor young child shivering there, um, but uh, not too hot. Um, I've talked to older patients with atopic dermatitis and some, because of the itching, they'll get in the shower, they'll turn it up as high as they can. And so it's getting, it's heating them up, causing some dilatation of the blood vessels and actually then they itch more. And so something in between, and I already mentioned that non-bathing is very much less popular. Next slide, please. I wanted to mention wet wraps. Again, these instructions are available at the National Eczema Association. Um, you, if sometimes there are flares and the parents have actually, um, they like the wet wrap. Sometimes we use them. If a child has a need to be hospitalized, they'll get wet wraps in the hospital. And there's a significant improvement and so again, there will be parents who ask, can we do that at home? And again, the instructions for doing this at home are available on uh, our eczema action plan. So you start out with uh, after bathing and using the emollient, uh, for some children we'll use the topical steroids and then apply a wet, gauze or clothing. I've had some parents tell me they use a pair of pajamas, a wet pair, and then cover that with a dry pair. And that ends up helping uh, get the seal. You have a better seal and increase the uh, absorption of the topical medication when you're using that. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things I think we've mentioned during our time together is that uh, giving uh, a prescription and we've talked about how much to give, how much, how much a particular child might need to use. Um, but then uh, I think more than once we've mentioned that if you're using very high potency steroids, one thing that we tend to do is use a small amount and then put only one refill or no refills on it. In general, we're thinking that we're going to put refills if we give uh, an amount that is useful for the family. Uh, some of our families, including some of the immigrant populations are not familiar with refills. So they'll come back to the appointment and they'll say, I used that medicine you gave me, it really helped, but then I ran out. And the the assumption on their part is that they were supposed to use it till it was gone. I have given refills, but it is important to, to talk about giving refills and, and what that might mean. Next slide, please. I wanna talk just a, a few minutes about pityriasis alba. Pityriasis alba occurs similarly in dark, darkly pigmented skin versus uh, Caucasian skin. Um, you see it in the spring, uh, you have a regular hypopigmented macules and patches, typically on the face is where it's most often noticed. In more darkly pigmented skin, it's more obvious. Uh, there's a little bit of scale with it. And particularly in those children who are more darkly pigmented, both the parents and the child may not be accustomed to using sunscreen and that's part of the recommendation. And so you may have to give a few more instructions about how to use sunscreen. So next slide, please. This is a child here on the cheek. Um, this child has pityriasis alba. Um, there may be a little bit of scale associated with it. They tend to be irregular. This is a common place that you see it. Um, the reason why it's seen in spring is that it's you've gone through a winter uh, where there's less sun exposure. Um, in Ohio and Indiana, there's less sun exposure. And then when the children go out into the sun, those areas on the outside of the lesion um, become more pigmented. And those in the, as part of the lesion are um, less pigmented. And so that makes this obvious. 
Next slide, please. Okay, sunscreen, just in a, a little bit uh, about sunscreen, um, that it's important to apply the sunscreen. I recommend to parents to do it every day so they don't have to decide, well, it's it's cloudy outside. We're not going outside today. Um, but just to put it on every day and then they're prepared for every situation. If they're swimming or sweating quite a bit, um, then to reapply that. Um, generics work well. Um, there aren't Although the companies who sell the sunscreen are very interested in their brand name, uh, the generics actually work well. So I tell parents they can, if there is a brand name that they're particularly interested in, they can go to whatever store they are looking at and see what that store their generic is, um, because that can decrease the expense. Um, zinc oxide products in darkly pigmented skin, um, they can leave a, sort of a whitish film looking uh, on the skin. Um, I uh, appreciated that for my own son uh, because then I knew where I had put the sunscreen. Uh, and if there were areas that didn't have this look to it, then I would know to reapply it. Next slide, please. Okay. Okay. Th thank you very much, Beth. That was wonderful information. We're going to switch gears a little bit and, and touch on other topics that, that come uh, become very important and kind of practical when we're seeing patients with atopic dermatitis. And, and one of the topics that we wanted to touch on was the issue of uh, steroid phobia. Very often, parents or sometimes patients as they get older, they come in with very significant concerns about the use of steroids, of topical steroids, uh, especially the long-term use of the prolonged use of topical steroids. I think it is important to understand kind of where these uh, concerns are coming from, where this steroid phobia is coming from. Definitely friends and families uh, is, is a big source uh, from this. If they have a relative, if they have a friend who may have had a maybe a negative experience with with the use of these medications, then they're going to tell all their all their friends uh, um, about it, and the, and they're going to increase that that concern um, or that fear of using this this topical medications. But it might also come from from providers, you know, even from even from dermatologists sometimes, from primary care uh, providers, and 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 actually from pharmacists. Uh, they they may be reading the package insert very uh, literally to to the patients, and that causes a lot of uh, concern to the parents or to the patients who are using these medications. And of course, social media. Social media is a big uh, source of great information, but is also a big source of misinformation. And a lot of the steroid phobia that our parents are coming in with now is really being uh, triggered or really being sourced by social media um, uh, information and really uh, often not the best, not the best information. Uh, next slide. Now, sometimes we can uh, we can easily um, kind of disprove a concern or, or or put the parents at ease of, of a concern. Sometimes parents come in and they have the concern that their child is gonna look like Hans and Franz uh, by using steroids on their on their skin, and we can you know very uh, uh, easily educate the parents that we're not talking about anabolic steroids. We're talking about a different type of steroid. We're talking about corticosteroids, which have a very different mechanism of action and we can uh, reassure them that their child is not going to look like a like a bodybuilder so that's not that's just that's just not going to happen so that's often an, an easy um, an easy discussion and an easy way to explain that this is a very different type of medication and there should be no concerns about these potential um, side effects next slide now, sometimes parents come in with a lot of concerns about topical steroids and you uh, sit down with them and you explain to them that these are safe medications when they're used appropriately and you give them a prescription for a low potency topical steroid, maybe a, a 2.5% hydrocortisone, and they go home, they pick it up from the pharmacy, and if they happen to read the package insert, this is what they're going to find. If you look at the package insert of topical steroids, and it really doesn't matter what potency it is, it will say things about uh, suppression of the HPA axis, risk for Cushing syndrome, any uh, problems with growth and development, 
Um, and then it talks about adverse reactions, burning, itching, hypopigmentation, which is a big one, especially for patients with darker skin type. So, so really no wonder why these parents have uh, concerns about using topical, topical steroids. Um, and I think some of those concerns uh, are very well-founded if, if, they, if they happen to read the package, uh, the package answer. But the reality is that the safe use of, uh, of topical steroids really prevents or avoids a lot of these potential uh, side effects or a lot of these, a lot of these concerns. Um, so we can you know, often have to uh, you know, re-educate them as they come back and they ask about, well, you told me it was safe, but the package insert says all of these potential side effects. And, and really this is something that is included in all topical steroids no matter the, the potency. And we know that particularly lower potency topical steroids are a lot safer, especially for, for pediatric patients. So just, just to give you kind of more, uh, an example or, or one of the some of the reasoning behind the concerns that a lot of the parents may come in with. Next slide. Now, the reason why parents might be concerned or patients might be concerned or, or the main reason why patients may have this steroid phobia is really two kind of twofold. One is the, the concern for potential side effects and the side effects can be local side effects or it can be systemic side effects. But the other concern that parents might have is the potential of steroid addiction. Other terms are, that have been used for this or are used for this steroid addiction is topical steroid withdrawal. Uh, the other is red skin syndrome. So parents are very concerned that if they, if they start using topical steroids, then there's no, there's no way back. You know, they, they're going to have to continue to use these medications that their child is going to become addicted to their topical steroid. And that every time they're going to need to use stronger and stronger topical steroids to really keep things under, under control. So we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, next slide. So with regards to the side effects, so let's talk a little bit about the local side effects of the, or the potential um, cutaneous side effects. So you, again, if you look at the, at the package insert, you'll see a long list of, of different potential um, adverse events on the skin. It can cause skin thinning, it can cause stretch marks, hypopigmentation, maybe the blood vessels will become more noticeable or form telangiectasias. In some patients, if we use it on the face, it can cause acne or rosacea, or in younger patients, maybe some peri or facial dermatitis. Of these side effects, <clears throat> I think hypopigmentation is a, is a big one, especially when we're treating patients with darker skin types. Uh, sometimes the parents are much more concerned about the medication bleaching their child's skin and making their child's skin look, uh, look very light. Uh, in reality, when we see this, most of the time is not from the topical steroid. Most of the time, this hypopigmentation is a post-inflammatory hypopigmentation. So it's actually from the eczema. And as we're getting the eczema inflammation under control, well, the way we explain it to the parents is sometimes the eczema leaves a footprint. Sometimes the footprint is lighter in color. Sometimes the footprint is darker in color. And uh, very often in patients with darker skin type, it will be lighter in color. So we have to reassure them that that hypopigmentation is more from the eczema inflammation. And the way to get rid of it is by continuing to control the eczema by using uh, uh, topical steroids appropriately. So most of the time, this really comes from the eczema and not from the topical steroid, unless we're using very high potency. Now, the reality is that this... Uh, are, are true potential side effects um, of topical steroids, but these are going to be much more likely with higher potency topical steroids. If we use higher potency topical steroids, particularly on thin skin sides, on the face, on the, on the neck, um, under the arms, in the groin area, these are thin skin sides uh, that are much more prone to these to this potential side effects. And again, with prolonged use, and particularly with higher potency topical steroids. Now, most of these side effects or all of these side effects, except perhaps from the stretch marks, um, really resolve after, after discontinuation. So even if we start to notice some of this, uh, with time, these will go away uh, once the topical steroids are discontinued. Next slide. The other main concern that parents may have um, and that we should have as well is the potential for side effects. Is the medication being absorbed into the bloodstream? Is the, is the medication being absorbed into their system? And could it potentially cause systemic side effects? And the main side effects that we consider here are the risk of adrenal suppression and of course the potential issues with growth um, and development. Uh, the adrenal suppression or a pathologic adrenal suppression ha has really been rarely reported, um, especially in, in pediatric patients. And again, this happens 
or has been reported, particularly when uh, high potency topical steroids are used for a prolonged period of time on a really um, a large area um, of, of the body. So typically with appropriate use of topical corticosteroids, we can reassure the parents that there's not gonna be enough uh, systemic absorption to cause any problems with growth and development. Next slide. Now let's talk a little bit about this steroid addiction. And this is really something that has gained a lot of traction on social media. You can see a lot of uh, TikToks on, uh, on this topical steroid withdrawal. Uh, again, the other name is red skin syndrome. This photo here, it's a photo from the, uh, photograph from the National Eczema Association website uh, talking about this, uh, this potential um, side effect or this potential adverse event of topical steroid use. Um, and, and usually the way it presents is as the patients stop using their topical steroids after having used topical steroids for a long time, then the skin gets really red and they experience more burning more than, more than itching. Now, the reality is that this doesn't really happen very often in pediatric patients, has not been really reported very often in pediatric patients. And in my experience, I have rarely, if ever, seen this. And, and perhaps it, it is because we have maybe um, in the pediatric world, we're a little bit more uh, judicious or more careful in the use of topical steroids. So, so this is not something that we uh, typically or often see in pediatric patients. So just, just there, we can reassure the parents. The patients that have been found to be at high risk are usually female patients, adult female patients, if they are using, again, mid to high potency topical steroids for prolonged periods of time, on thin, uh, thin skin areas, on the face, on the genitals. Sometimes topical steroids are included in some cosmetic products, and that can cause a lot of um, a lot of this uh, a lot of this issue. So, so in general, we can we can uh, reassure our parents that this is not something that will uh, that we expect to see happening in in pediatric patients. And also, the reality is that there's still a lot about this potential side effect that we don't know about. There's still a lot that we need to learn and a, a lot that we need to figure out of what, what really is topical steroid withdrawal. Next slide. So one of the, the, the issues with the topical uh, steroid phobia is, you know, what are the consequences? What happens when, when parents um, are afraid of using these medications and don't use these medications? Of course, if parents are concerned about it, they're not gonna use it. So their compliance with the, with the plan that we give them is gonna be pretty poor. And if they're not compliant with the topical use of these medications, then their their atopic dermatitis is not going to be well controlled, and if atopic dermatitis is not well controlled, then that leads to a cascade of of um, other consequences or other complications like super infection. Kids will not be sleeping well at night. They're going to wake up uh, tired in the morning. They're not going to do well in school. So I think it's also important to give the parents a big picture of what would happen if we don't keep their eczema um, under control. And I think it's also important to mention to the parents that uh, based on scientific evidence and uh, on uh, very well-respected guidelines from the American Academy of, of Dermatology, topical steroids are really the cornerstone and are really the mainstay of therapy for our patients with, with atopic dermatitis. The other problem with steroid phobia is that sometimes parents would be more likely to use uh, alternative treatments. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit uh, more about like natural treatments but, but unfortunately, a lot of these alternative treatments, we really don't know much about. There's no scientific evidence, very limited scientific evidence, and may actually be more harmful um, to the patient. But, but parents sometimes are more willing to use something that is not a topical steroid, but we also have to, to caution them that we don't know much about other treatments um, and may actually be more, uh, more harmful to, to their child. Next slide. Some of the tips um, that, that we can use or some, some of the information that we can use to help parents understand um, and to help parents kind of get a little bit over the, the steroid phobia. It's, I think a big part of it is to listen to, to the parents and listen to the patient and, and really ask them what are their specific concerns. It may be as simple as they think we are going to be using anabolic steroids and we can very easily um, put them at ease that we're not using anabolic steroids, that we're gonna, not going to make their child look like a bodybuilder. Um, education, that's going to be very important with every, with every visit. We have a, an opportunity to educate the parents, to let them know that we're using um, safe medications when, when these are used um, appropriately. Sometimes I find it very helpful to show the parents the chart of the topical steroid potency and show them, look, we are using the lowest potency 
topical steroid that we can use. There's, there's really high potency and there's very low potency and we're using very low potency topical corticosteroids. And so that often when they, when they see this, um, uh, the, the relative uh, potency of the different medications, they can, they can be reassured that they're actually using a, a mild one or a lower potency one. Um, and they might be more, more likely um, to use them. Um, very important with every, every visit to educate and re-educate on the appropriate use. We don't want to be using topical steroids as moisturizer. We don't want to use a topical steroid on normal skin. We really want to use it on areas where the um, atopic dermatitis is, is active, areas where there is inflammation. What I tell the parents is go by the feel and not by the look, meaning that use the topical steroid if the skin feels rough um, and scaly or it's itchy. Uh, especially with patients with darker skin type, as I mentioned before, there can be some footprints left behind. The, the skin can be darker, can be lighter. Um, but if the skin feels smooth, I tell them just use the moisturizer if it feels smooth. If it start, starts to feel rough um, then or scaly, then that's where we want to start using the topical, uh, the topical steroids. And of course, the very, very important is that we're using the adequate potency on the adequate body site. Um, this is really going to vary from patient to patient. Uh, so it, it's, it's a little bit difficult to give a very kind of specific recipe or a very specific recommendation on this. Next slide. Now, we do have some alternatives, some non-steroid alternatives um, as far as topical treatment uh, comes. So we will often use this um, to take breaks from the topical steroids or for parents who have more concerns with topical steroid use. So the uh, the, the two most common ones are the calcineurin inhibitors, the tacrolimus and pimicrolimus. Uh, there's a couple of newer ones, the crisabarol and a topical ruxolitinib, which was most, uh, this is a JAK inhibitor, most, most recently approved for patients who are 12 years of age and older with atopic dermatitis. Um, the problem is that a lot of these medications are very expensive and many of our patients really don't have access to these medications. And also the reality is that some of these actually don't work as well as topical steroids, especially if there's a bad flare. With bad flares, often the topical steroids are gonna be our best bet to get things under control. But we do have some alternatives. And I, li I like to use particularly the calcineurin inhibitors if we're dealing with eczema on areas with, um, with thinner skin. So for example, if there's a lot of eczema around the eyes, uh, or very persistent, persistent eczema on the face or on the neck, on thin skin um, areas, then this, this will become very, very helpful. Also, sometimes for parents that may be a little bit more concerned, uh, we'll take some breaks, uh, even during the flare. So I may tell them, well, let's use this topical medication, this topical steroid during the week, twice a day during the week, and then we'll take the weekends off. So two days off, five days on. That is a way that we can uh, maybe compromise um, a little bit on the use of topical steroids, but still get the benefit of decreasing the inflammation and, and for the eczema flare to get under control much, uh, much better. Uh, the other thing that I tend to do is see them sooner, see them sooner in follow up, see how they're doing, um, and, and take those opportunities to re educate and talk again about the safety um, of topical steroids when used appropriately. Next slide. All right, let's switch gears a little bit to natural treatment. So I think especially in the last few years, more and more I hear from parents that they wanna use something that's natural. They don't wanna use any prescription medication. They wanna use something that is natural. And you might recognize the natural plant on this background that is poison ivy. So I'll often use that example for the parents. They tell them, well, poison ivy is natural, but it doesn't mean that it's the best thing that you can use on your skin. So I think that there, there has to be a lot of also listening and a lot of education on that. Just because something says that it's natural, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be the best option for, um, for a child, particularly a child with very sensitive skin, a child with atopic dermatitis. Next slide. Now there's, uh, there's been actually some research looking at different oils, so natural oils and what the effect of those oils on the skin is. Some of these oils are actually, might actually be beneficial and we can recommend them, but there's other ones that we might actually want to avoid because it can make things worse. So we have the best evidence to support the use of sunflower seed oil and coconut oil. There's been some studies looking at the use of this, 
of these uh, natural oils on the skin. And they actually seem to um, increase the moisturization, keep the water inside the, the skin and, um, and potentially decrease some of the inflammation and irritation that is associated with eczema. On the other hand, one type of oil that we want to avoid is olive oil. So if olive oil actually has been shown to increase the water loss. So it does the exact opposite of what we want to do. And it can actually cause more irritation. Also, yeast loves olive oil. So the way that we grow yeast in the lab is by using olive oil. So especially for uh, patients, particularly with, with infants who may have a um, scalp involvement. So if they have seborrheic dermatitis or cradle cap, uh, there's often a yeast component to it. So olive oil is one type of natural oil that we want to avoid. Olive oil is very um, commonly used, uh, particularly in, middle, in the Middle East and uh, Mediterranean. Uh, so patients who are coming from those countries are mu much more used to using olive oil. But um, for patients with atopic dermatitis, then we, we probably want to uh, steer them away from this and maybe um, show them other types of oils that we can use. Next slide. Now, essential oils. Essential oils have become also very, very popular. Everyone's using essential oils for every, uh, for different indications and for different, for different reasons. Now, the reality is that essential oils are very concentrated, typically plant extracts, although there are a lot of ingredients that are, are um, included in them. And the reality is that these are really concentrated fragrances. Um, the ingredients are going to be very viable. There's no FDA regulation to the use of this. So uh, I find it interesting sometimes that parents are, would be much more comfortable, comfortable and much more likely to use something that is not FDA regulated versus a topical steroid that is obviously FDA regulated. But also parents don't know this. So, so I think also education on, uh, on this issue uh, is going to be important. Essential oils are, is something that I don't really love um, to use. So if a parent, uh, if a patient is using essential oils on their skin, I would really try to steer them away from using this and maybe have them use more of a natural oil like the coconut oil, sunflower seed oil. The main concern that I have with essential oils as because these are concentrated fragrances typically, um, to use it on somebody with sensitive skin, use it on somebody with atopic dermatitis, then we actually increase the risk of a contact dermatitis. And it could be either an irritant um, dermatitis or an allergic contact dermatitis. Um, obviously, these would be more likely if we apply directly on the skin. But sometimes, very often, these oils are going to be put into diffusers. And some patients may actually develop an airborne contact dermatitis. So even if it's on a diffuser, even if it's not applied directly on the skin, it might also cause some issues. So, so I'm, 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 uh, I'm often... Uh, discouraging the use of essential oils, especially these are really very nicely fragranced, uh, which typically is not the best uh, for our patients. Next slide. Now, another natural treatment that we can that we can recommend is the use of oatmeal. There's actually been studies looking at, at colloidal um, oatmeal, um, particularly in patients with atopic dermatitis. And some studies have shown that it improves the microbiome um, in these patients and might also repair the skin bar barrier. So um, often patients will ask, can I do an oatmeal bath? And uh, that's something that they, they can typically do. It can be very soothing uh, for their skin. It gets the itching under control. So oatmeal is one of those natural uh, treatments that have shown some, uh, some benefits um, in, in patients with atopic dermatitis. Next slide. Now let's uh, talk a little bit about um, East and West or East meets West. Uh, we, as we are seeing more and more patients from very diverse cultural backgrounds, or we, as we are seeing more and more um, immigrant uh, populations, we have to really kind of take into consideration their cultural practices, their, uh, the, the type of medicine that they are more, uh, more used to. Um, and, and, um, a lot of the patients are also asking for alternative medicine or different ways to treat, uh, to treat their, their skin or to treat their child's um, uh, skin concerns. And there's been some, some studies looking at some of these um, cultural practices or some more of Eastern type of medicine um, in a topic dermatitis. So I'll just briefly mention some of these. Next slide. 
So one, um, one of those therapies is massage therapy. Um, it, there's been studies looking at massage therapy for atopic dermatitis, and these have been shown to lower anxiety. I think, I think we can all agree with that. Uh, but also these studies have shown that it improves uh, other physical findings or clinical findings, the redness, the erythema, scaliness, uh, even the itchiness on, on the patient. So this can be very beneficial. Massage therapy is really something that's becoming more mainstream. Um, we see massage therapists in the hospital um, all the time for, for um, hospitalized patients. Uh, so this is really becoming really more, more mainstream and there's some evidence to support the use for patients with atopic dermatitis. Next slide. The other is acupuncture and acupressure. Uh, there's been studies looking at this for atopic dermatitis. And, and the main benefit of acupuncture and acupressure is that it makes the itchiness better. It improves the, the patient's pruritus. So this is something that might be, that might be very helpful uh, or helpful in this, um, in this instance. Next slide. Now, we also have to um, know about the cultural practices that our patients are doing uh, based on their traditions, based on their, on their culture, because some of these practices can cause some issues with the skin. So these are all photographs from a publication um, from the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology showing some of those um, effects on the, on the skin. The patient on the top left, this is a, a reaction from herbal uh, Chinese medicine, the top, the bottom left, uh, the, the kind of the consequences are what we would expect with moxibustion. Um, and the two photographs on, on the right, this is what happens on the skin with pointing. So these are all kind of the cutaneous effect or the, or the skin effects of different cultural practices. Next slide. And these are two of my patients. Uh, the patient on the left, she, um, as you can see, she was doing uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of henna. Um, decoration on, on her skin. And you can start to see a lot of bubbles popping up, uh, especially on her right hand. So this is an allergic contact dermatitis to the, and, uh, a chemical that they put into natural henna um, to make it darker. It's PPD. And some patients are allergic to it and they, they will develop this, uh, this type of reaction, and especially patients who have eczema, who have very sensitive skin, then they're much more likely uh, to develop this. Um, but uh, henna is very, very commonly used in, in a lot of the, the patient populations that we see here. And so it's important to, to take that into consideration. The patient on the right has a, a bunch of little kind of uh, circular scars all over his trunk and actually his face as well. And this is a, a culture, a cultural practice called fire burning. So when he was a younger uh, patient, when he was an infant, actually, he was, uh, he underwent this, this practice basically with, with burning um, of, of the skin because he was a very sickly, sickly patient. So I think it is important for us to recognize the different practices that our patients are, are, um, are doing and so that we can counsel them on whether those are safe or not for the skin, particularly when we, uh, when we um, are dealing with patients with sensitive skin, with patients with um, eczema. Next slide. I believe that brings us to the end. I'll turn it over to Chris. Great. Thank you both for uh, not only your time, but your expertise. Um, you know, I, I thought that was a sort of a great review of, of many topics that I think we've gotten questions on since we've begun this project. So just kind of want to remind everybody, again, if you have any questions about any of the topics or material that was presented today or questions on topics that, that maybe we didn't get a chance to cover, please reach out to Brooke with any questions and she will forward it to our medical expert team. Um, again, want to thank both um, Pat and Esteban for their time and expertise today. And we look forward to seeing all of you at our next action period call. Hello, and welcome to this webinar that's going to showcase the Ohio American Academy of Pediatrics Atopic Dermatitis Resources. Next slide. My name is Chris Peltier. I'm the uh, primary care expert for the Ohio AAP Atopic Dermatitis Project. I'm a general pediatrician in Cincinnati with Pediatric Associates of Mount Carmel, and I'm also honored to serve as the president of the Ohio chapter of the AAP. And I will serve as um, your presenter for this webinar. Next slide. 
So we're going to go over some resources that the chapter has that are available for you to help when you're managing your patients with atopic dermatitis. Um, I would strongly encourage that you um, also review the chapter's atopic dermatitis educational webinar that was recorded in June of 2023, as many of these topics go into more detail. But again, really the purpose of this webinar is just to briefly highlight and showcase some of the chapter's website um, resources that are available for you and your patients with atopic dermatitis. And the first is our eczema action plan. And, and this is probably one that I use the most in practice. Um, we developed it during our first wave of the atopic dermatitis project. And as you can see, it really is, is outlined and based on the asthma action plan. So there's the green zone when everything's going well. There's the yellow zone where maybe your patients are starting to have a little bit more symptoms. And then of course there's the red zone when there's, there's a really bad flare up. And we're just gonna briefly dive into sort of each of these zones. Next slide. So the green zone, as you would think, right, green means go. Everything's going well, right? The goal is comfort. Um, and really then we are going to maintain. And I think sort of the, the two things I'll highlight from, from this um, part of the action plan is regular, consistent use of moisturizers, as well as regular, short, lukewarm, lukewarm baths. Next slide. Then when things are starting to get a little bit more symptomatic, our patients may be calling or coming to us and, and with the beginning of a flare, really the goal is to manage this to prevent it from progressing to a more severe flare. And, and I think really the key action step in this zone is starting the use of topical medications. Next slide. And then unfortunately, as we know, sometimes despite us intervening early in that yellow zone, that some of our patients will go on to a more severe flare and end up in that red zone. Um, which is really the rescue zone. Um, and here, um, I think the key I want to point out in this stage of the plan is considering the increase in potency of topical steroids that you may be present, you know, that you may be prescribing for your patients. Next slide. So that's the asthma action plan or sorry, the eczema action plan, which is based on the asthma action plan. Um, the second tool that's available that I wanted to go over is the quality of life screening tool. And, and this really came about um, with our work on atopic dermatitis and really realizing that it is not only a dermatologic or skin problem, right? That we know that children with atopic dermatitis, a chronic disease, definitely can affect their quality of life as well as their mental health. And so this is a screening tool that's available. You can see the link there and they're listed on the left side of the page. Um, the it comes for different ages. So there's an infant scale that's available for kids up to age four. There's a child version that contains both a cartoon and a written version up to 16 years. And then there's a teenager young adult that goes from 12 to 19 years of age. Next slide. And so just some of the questions that are asked in the child quality of life index are, you know, how itchy or scratchy has your skin been? How embarrassed or self-conscious or, or has this, have your symptoms made you sad because of how your skin looks? Has it affected your friendships? Does it change the type of clothes that you wear? Do you no longer do things because of, you know, concern about how your skin looks? Has it affected sort of physical participation in swimming or sports? Is it affecting your schoolwork? Have you know you've been sort of uh, been bullied or teased because of the way your skin looks? We know that because of the itching involved in atopic dermatitis, that definitely sleep can be a huge problem. So we want to make sure that we address that. Um, and then also, you know, we realize that, that some of the things that we're asking for families and kids to do um, can take some time and are not often easy. So we want to make sure that we're addressing the impact of the treatments that we're recommending for the skin problem. Next slide. And then this is just sort of the cartoon version of it um, for maybe some of your younger kids um, to sort of answer. Next slide. The third resource um, I, I want to um, talk about is, is how to help families properly do a bleach bath. You know, our, our dermatologic experts that we've been blessed to work with on this, this practice, you know, talk a lot about using bleach baths um, two to three times per week to help reduce inflammation and decreasing the risk of secondary staph infection. Um, so you will see that there's a QR code that will take you to some resources. 
But essentially, um, you obviously need a bathtub. You need some water. Um, regular unconcentrated household bleach at 5.25%, and then measuring spoons and cups. And again, the specific details can be found by going to that QR code. Next slide. The next resource that we um, have learned from our dermatologic experts that really can help with moisturizing and preventing flare-ups are wet wraps. And not only preventing, but very useful during flares. So these wet wraps are applied after bathing, the use of an emollient, and then maybe the application of a topical uh, steroid. You wanna apply wet, warm water, gauze, or clothing, and then you're going to cover with a dry gauze or clothing. Next slide. And again, you'll see a QR code here on the screen that will take you to the wet wrap step-by-step -step infographic that you can then print out and provide to your families. Um, again, very visual, specific how to do this instead of just assuming you're, you, know, you tell a family, well, just do a wet wrap. You know, this will tell them specifically how to do it and how to do it properly to get the most effect. We also have several rat cards. Um, and the first one I wanna sort of highlight is talking um, about sort of social media and safe internet use. And that we know that there are many um, both helpful and appropriate um, tips on social media, but also some that aren't so helpful and maybe also be so dangerous um, to, to kids' skin. So, you know, being able to talk about families of not trusting everything that they may see on TikTok. We also have an atopic dermatitis talking points um, that talks about, you know, where really the importance of following evidence-based recommendations. Um, and so all of that information is available um, that, you know, you can share with um, your other providers as well as your families. Next slide. We have some other rat cards that are made specifically for both teens and families um, with talking about um, what's up with my skin and really talking about that atopic dermatitis affects children of all skin colors, races, and ethnicities. And then we have our facts for family that really talks about um, sort of that itch scratch cycle and, and talking about really what is eczema and how common it, it actually is. And these are all available um, for you to download and provide to your families and your patients. Next slide. As a primary care provider, I'm sure you do too. I know I do get a lot of questions about, well, what's the right sunscreen and, and what should families and parents look for? So you want to look at what are the ingredients? Um, you know, what is, uh, you know, is it a broad spectrum? Does it protect against both UVA and UVB rays? Is it water resistant? And, and what's the SPF that should be done? So the recommendations are, you know, using a sunscreen that's broad spectrum, protecting against both UVA and B, um, SPF of 30 or higher, um, and then water resistant. And then reminding families um, that, you know, um, sunscreen can really no longer be claimed to be waterproof or sweatproof. Um, it's water resistant. And the reminder that, you know, you have to do frequent every, you know, 60 to 90 minutes, you're going to have to reapply that sunscreen if you're going to get wet or your, your child may be sweating. Next slide. So some of the specific recommendations for infants and children with sensitive skin, like atopic dermatitis, these are some of the products that our dermatology experts on the program have recommended. Next slide. One of the things that I know I get questions about from my patients with atopic dermatitis is, you know, when I say I'm going to use a topical steroid, they hear that word steroid and, and it makes them very nervous, right? You know, they, they, they hear about the side effects of systemic steroids and obviously the risk to athletes with anabolic steroids. Um, and so this is a real phenomenon and it's something that we have to sort of listen to our patients and our families about. We need to ask them what their specific concerns are. It's very important to educate our patients and our caregivers and reminding them that number one, there is these are topical steroids. These are not ingested. They are not systemic. We do not see the same side effects that we do with oral steroids or obviously injectable anabolic steroids. 
I think it's important, um, you know, to to remember starting off with the lowest potent steroid as possible, very similar to how we approach bacterial infections, right? We want to use the least broad spectrum antibiotic. We want to use the least potent steroid to decrease any potential risks of side effects um, that, that may be associated with using topical steroids um, to the skin. So in a minute, I'm going to show you um, a topical steroid potency chart that, that you can download. Um, reminding patients how to properly use topical steroids, right? This is not a moisturizer. Moisturizers, families can put on their kids' skin as often as they want, right? We only want to use topical steroids on the active areas and flares of the part of the body where the atopic dermatitis is occurring. And then remembering that different body sites may require different potencies of steroids. Next slide. And as I promised, um, here is a nice chart. These are also, um, you know, available in multiple places um, on, on the internet. But here is a, a, something that you can take a screenshot of and, and save for your practice that goes through, um, you know, the different classes of, of uh, steroid potency um, that are really there from high, super high, down, down to, to a much lower potency. Next slide. Want to take a moment because one of the things um, with our second wave of the Atopic Dermatitis Ohio Aid Project that we've really been focusing on is diversity, equity, inclusion, and considering cultural considerations. And, and remembering that there are lots of things that go into um, families' perception of atopic dermatitis, as well as how they're going to react and use different treatment modalities. Um, I think it's important to remember that not all cultures or families are familiar with the concept of prescription refills, especially if they're first generation. Maybe it was different than, than the country from which they immigrated from. So, you know, letting a family know that I'm providing multiple refills and you just need to go to the pharmacy when that tube is out um, to, to get another one. You don't necessarily need to call the office unless you're having problems. Um, and, and then I think it's also important to remember when we are prescribing to make sure that our families are given an adequate amount of steroid, um, you know, in a tube. You know, a, a three gram tube is really not much steroid as opposed to maybe a 60 gram tube and giving plenty of refills as needed. And then I think it's also important to remember that not all cultures are knowledgeable about what alternative treatments are appropriate to use on their child's skin care. Next slide. So again, just a brief review of some of the resources that are available um, from the Ohio AAP to help your patients and families with atopic dermatitis. Again, for a more in-depth discuss discussion involving our pediatric dermatology experts, I would recommend that you listen and view the atopic dermatitis educational webinar from June of 2023. And again, if you have any questions, um, please reach out to, to the Ohio AAP chapter and one of our staff members will um, get back to you and point you in the direction. And again, thank you for your time and have a great day.